Good evening. I'm Jean Marie Procious, Executive Director of the Salem Athenaeum. Thank you for joining us to discuss censorship, a topic that affects all libraries, including the Athenaeum. Reading is power. The founders of our library back in 1760 knew that access to a broad array of books and ideas was critical for the development of a strong society. 263 years later, we are still champions for the cause. Censorship has an even longer history and comes in many forms. The news has been filled with recent examples. Tonight, we will learn about the recent rise in challenges to curriculum, books, and programs at schools and libraries, and the new methods being used to intimidate and threaten teachers and librarians. Our speakers will outline the trends and offer guidance on how to protect our rights to intellectual freedom. Andrea Fiorillo is co-chair of the Massachusetts Library Association's Intellectual Freedom and Social Responsibility Committee and head of research and reader services at Reading Public Library. Sharon Hawks has been involved in the public library field since 2005, after a long career in the performing arts. She received her undergraduate degree from NYU in 1980 and her master's degree in library and information science from Syracuse University in 2008. She has served as director of Nahans Library since 2015. Her interest in the recent spate of book banning stems from a protest over a book where she once worked in Lewiston, Auburn, Maine. Andrea will start us off. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much to the Salem Athenaeum on behalf of Sharon and I for hosting tonight's event. And thank you so much to you, members of the public who care enough to come out and hear about this topic. Um, so we are going to be talking tonight about um, our library values. We're going to define some terms. We're going to talk about what's going on in Massachusetts and the rest of the U.S. around issues of censorship and offer ideas for what you can do in your community to defend intellectual freedom. So sometimes even superheroes need to call a different set of superheroes to um, get some help. And in this case, Batman clearly needs a librarian um, because we are intellectual freedom fighters. We have a strong sense of ethics, which guide our profession. Since the 1930s, we've had something called the Library Bill of Rights, which I printed out to give to you all tonight, but now we're all in our separate spaces. So I will share that in the chat later on in the evening. Um, one of the tenets of the Library Bill of Rights is that we stand against censorship. Um, we're anti-censorship. We stand for services and access for all. Public school librarians create collections and instruction based on curricula and the educational and recreational needs of students. Public librarians curate collections and services based on a long list of criteria, including demand, currency, quality, and the needs of the community. Um, so what is intellectual freedom? We can sum it up as these three freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of access, freedom from surveillance, which could also be called um, the right to privacy. So uh, freedom of expression, almost anything falls under expression. Those sort of all of the First Amendment freedoms are expression. Anything that a library has in it, um, movies, music, books, those are forms of expression. Access to those things is what libraries do. That's, that's what we're about. We're, we're there to provide access to all manner of human art and expression. We do have standards. We don't just, we don't just hold anything on our shelves. We try to avoid collecting things like propaganda or hate speech or stuff that's just terribly outdated and inaccurate. Um, for the most part, we try to avoid things that are very low quality, according to um, critics. Um, but we do try to offer something for everyone. Um, freedom from surveillance. So why is this important? This is important because if you can't read, watch, listen to all of this expression with some measure of privacy, you, you aren't really experiencing intellectual freedom. Um, and that, that becomes especially important when you need to find out about a sensitive topic, maybe a disease that you're not ready to share with others or an abusive relationship, addiction. There are all kinds of information needs that we have that should be private. So what does it mean to ban or challenge a book? 
um, a lot of people talk about book bans when maybe it would be more accurate to talk about a challenge. So a ban is when an item or a service is, is um, removed or canceled because of content. But a challenge is the attempt to remove or restrict materials or services based on content. So often a challenge is not successful and then it doesn't become a ban, um, but often it is. And those, we'll, we'll be hearing a little bit more about that. So Americans loved libraries and library workers, but not so much censorship. So what we see, well, actually, I don't think you can totally see my screen here. Whoops. I feel like part of it, oh, there it is. So it, this um, on the right is the favorability of local and public school libraries. Um, by a survey done by the American Library Association, you can see 90% of voters approve of um, school and public libraries, 92% of parents um, surveyed approve. The American Family Survey put out by Deseret News and BYU, which is a Mormon publication and a Mormon university, say that just 12% of Americans agree that books should be removed from libraries if a parent objects. Only 16% believe public school libraries include inappropriate books. 65% said it was important for public school libraries to represent a variety of perspectives about controversial issues, even if it makes some people uncomfortable. And the Every Library Institute um, survey from just a few months ago said 91% of voters strongly or somewhat agree with the statement, if you don't like a book at a library, don't check it out. Other people shouldn't be able to control what me or my family can read. So if book banning is so unpopular, why is it all the rage? Okay, so this next part gets a little bit uncomfortable. So just focus on these cute, confused dogs who love to read while I tell you these things. So a, a noisy minority of grassroots organizers are using libraries and schools to assert their values and stir up outrage on controversial issues. The American Library Association and numerous other organizations and media outlets have reported record-breaking challenge attempts in 2021 and 2022. 2023 is shaping up to be a banner year for bans as well. And I can tell you from my own experience talking to libraries throughout Massachusetts as chair of the Intellectual Freedom Social Responsibility Committee for the Massachusetts Library Association, that this is very much hitting home here in Massachusetts. It can be, the, the way this takes shape in other states, some other states can be much worse than what's happening in Massachusetts, but it's a very serious problem going on in Massachusetts. And um, as was stated earlier, it's not just book challenges, it's also to curricula, programs, and displays. Um, and why is this happening now? So I'm not a sociologist, and this is complicated, but uh, one thing that really, was took shape in 2021 was the parents' rights movement that sprung up during the pandemic. A lot of people were angry over school closures, mask mandates, pushes to get vaccines. Um, and for some reason, there's some alignment, there's some crossover with groups trying to get anti-racist teaching out of schools. There's also been some growing extremism um, a lot of undemocratic energy. In a democracy, we have to tolerate a lot of viewpoints and people that maybe we don't agree with, don't share our values, maybe we don't like them. But for a democracy to function, we all have to tolerate each other to uh, a reasonable extent. Um, there's been a deep discomfort with civil liberties gains by people of color and the decriminalization and decloseting of LGBTQ lives. All of this is fueled by social media, which is perfect for a quick spread of social movements, and in this case, misinformation and dehumanization of the other side. So who is challenging books in Massachusetts? And remember to think about those cute dogs um, during this one. So this is a small sampling of the groups out there in Massachusetts. Um, some of them are national groups, some of them 
really are just in Massachusetts, as you can see from the ones that say Massachusetts in the title. Um, it's a mix of Christian socialist, neo-Nazi, conspiracy theorist, um, some very well-organized parental rights groups like Moms for Liberty. Moms for Liberty was formed in 2021, and they have already been so effective in pushing for bans, censoring curricula, and legislating their values. Um, there are over 200 chapters throughout the U.S. that have sprung up in just over a year, and there are at least two in Massachusetts. Um, the Proud Boys, Super Happy Fun America, and NS131 are all militant groups espousing pro-gun, anti-gay, white supremacist ideologies who have been showing up to pride story times and frightening families throughout Massachusetts. Okay, so what's going on? Why is this so different than it has been in the past? Because censorship has been with us since time immemorial. Um, we've always found things so offensive that we want them um, taken away and out of sight and banned, but this is something different. So historically, a single concerned patron or parent initiated a challenge. Um, currently, we're seeing more organized or outside groups attempt to censor collections and services. So there might be a long list of books to ban that originate with an extremist group in Idaho, but it presents itself in Malden or in Salem um, because of social media. It's easy to circulate these lists of things they want to see taken out. Um, and the censors have been utilizing a playbook for how to incite outrage and challenge schools and libraries with tactics like a freedom of information request, which can be a wonderful thing when used for the good. Um, uh, an example of a freedom of information request gone awry was last year in a Massachusetts school there was a, a, a FOIA request for everything over the last five years that it had to do with teaching sexual education, which is part of the Massachusetts curriculum. You actually have to teach sex ed. Um, and not only, not only did they wanna know every, all the professional development and all of the curricula about sex ed, they also wanted every single title in the school library and in the classrooms and a whole other list of demands. And this is the kind of thing that uh, a school, if you've ever met a secretary at a school or a vice principal or principal, they are busy people. They do not have time to go through five years of records for something they haven't kept records on to try to come up with this information. Another tactic is misinformation. Um, if any of you were paying attention to the 2022 candidacy for um, attorney general, um, I'm sorry, secretary of state, Rayla Campbell, uh, she did not win, but she was visiting library after library and filming herself reading just the most um, naughty bits of a book and claiming that we were keeping in the children's room, which wasn't true, it was a book for teens, um, mostly that she was talking about, claiming that she was getting kicked out of these libraries, which she wasn't, um, and making all kinds of um, outrageous claims and then spreading that on social media, like it was fact. Um, another thing we're seeing is a lot of demands for quarries, so criminal background checks of library presenters. Now, uh, we would not get a quarry check for a supervised library presenter, say, if someone came in to do a concert, we would not quarry check them. Um, if we had someone right, coming in to read a story to children, that's a supervised event. Not only are there library staff there, but also we expect the caregivers to be there with the children. You can't just drop off your young kids at the library. Where we would quarry a volunteer, um, an example would be we have a homebound delivery service at my library. And because the volunteers are acting on behalf of the library and sometimes are with vulnerable populations going out and delivering to people's homes, we do quarry them. Um, so that's that's a reasonable request. But to just have uh, our presenters who are in supervised situations in a public building quarried is, is not a reasonable request. There's also been a lot of harassment of staff. I'm calling educators and librarians groomers, pornographers, pedophiles, um, doxing staff, which means releasing their personal information online, so maybe where they live, their phone number, the names of their family members, 
so that then the harassment can go from online to in person. Um, and again, these tactics are used to intimidate and overwhelm schools and libraries. So how is this playing out in our communities? Um, what we're looking at here on the left is uh, the most banned book of 21 and 22. Um, it's Gender Queer by Maya Kobabe. It's a graphic memoir for teens, graphic meaning that it has like comic book drawings in it. Um, and Kobabe writes and draws about their coming of age experience um, as a non-binary person, so someone who doesn't identify as, as male or female, and asexual, which means not ex experiencing sexual desire for others. But ironically, this book is challenged for being pornographic, which is defined as created solely to elicit sexual desire. So just a little bit of humor am amongst uh, all the other things I'm saying, it, that strikes me as a, a little bit silly. Um, and then on the right, we see a pride or a drag queen story time. They're the number one most challenged program in public libraries. Um, and a lot of people ask, what is a drag story time? So readers come dressed up in clothes that defy gender norms, but are family friendly. They read age appropriate books to children accompanied by their parent, supervised by library staff. They are not drag shows. They are not sexy burlesque. Um, and libraries include drag story times amongst the vast number of heteronormative story time offerings as a means of supporting queer families to foster healthy attitudes towards the LGBTQ experience, moving away from historic brutality, shame, and closeting of their lives. It is not a required program. We invite people who would get something from this experience to come out and, and enjoy it, but you can certainly choose not to bring your family to these events. Um, so a case study from my library, um, back in the good old days of 2019, I'm gonna just walk you through what a traditional challenge attempt looked like. We had um, a patron who was a regular romance reader. She came in, she pulled a romance book off the shelf, she took it home and read the whole thing. And she really didn't like how much profanity was in it. And she brought it back. She said, I find this really offensive. And she filled out what we called a reconsideration form, which is our way to petition um, when you don't like something in the collection, you know, we do have a procedure for that. I think Sharon's gonna tell you a little bit about that later, but we are going to listen to people tell us why they think something doesn't belong. Now we're gonna take that and we're gonna, we're gonna measure it against our collection development policy that tells us the criteria of why it would belong or why it wouldn't belong. And in this case, you know, the book was other people were still checking it out. So other people did like all that profanity. Um, it had decent reviews. So we kept it in the collection and she was fine with that. I mean, she probably wasn't delighted, but she, she didn't call us names or anything. Um, so fast forward to 2021, 2023, RPL was informally challenged and harassed over the book Gender Queer that we just talked about. Um, the book was put up on a Facebook group chat claiming that RPL was grooming children for sexual abuse um, and an adult who didn't have a teen with her um, went to the teen collection looking for this title and another with LGBTQ content. She didn't read either of the books. She took them straight to the director and asked why we had pornography and were giving it to young people. Um, Recently, neo-Nazis showed up to protest and harass attendees at Boston, Fall River, and Taunton um, Pride Story Times. That's happened, uh, sort of these protests have happened at various Pride Story Times. At RPL, um, we've hosted three, and we have had a freedom of information request come in just to kind of slow us down and um, uh, harass us. And we have had dozens of harassing phone calls, name calling, and the last, the last Pride story time we hosted, the Reading Police Department determined that we should have five police detail to deal with what they saw as the threat level. Um, 
families came out and enjoyed the event that wanted to come out and enjoy it. Um, so that was a good thing, but it wasn't the best experience ever. Um, so reasons for challenges. This word cloud was put together um, by the American Library Association. And the, the words that are the largest are the words that the people who were trying to censor materials had reported that they wanted it banned. They wanted it banned because of drugs. They wanted it banned because it was sexually explicit. Um, probably the funniest one on here is that it didn't have a happy ending <laughs> or that it was bleak. Um, we're sorry about that. Some stories are sad. But uh, if you really were to boil all of this, all of these words down, there would be three main areas that are under attack right now. It boils down to sex, gender, and race. And the most frequently censored topics involve sexuality and gender, especially LGBTQ content, and especially anti-racist content. Um, here we have a screen with the book titles of the most challenged books of 2021. Um, some of them are classics, some of them have just been published in the last few years. Um, these, these align closely with the most challenged books of 2022 as well. And if you know anything about these books, you would know that uh, a disproportionate amount of them are written by people of color and are written by queer folks. And so when I look at these books together, what I see is not books being censored, but people being silenced. And that's what I always like to remind people as I talk about this stuff is that it's not just about works of art and books not being available. It's not just about programs being shut down. It's that certain people are being censored and told that they don't have a voice. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Sharon. Hello, everybody. There we are. Uh, I wanted to um, come at this a slightly different way, but you'll hear a lot of the same facts coming at you. I want to talk about some of the arguments that are currently being made against books, uh, particularly online. Uh, I've spent over a year now speaking on Facebook with people who want to know what's going on and people who want to argue in favor of banning books in some circumstances. So here's some of what I learned. So people ask, isn't it just about books for young children? For example, the uh, legislation right now in Florida, uh, everybody says, oh no, that's just for young children. Well, if you look at the chart on the right, you can see that 49% uh, of them are for young adults. That means teenagers and, uh, and young adults. So no, it's not just about little kids. Little kids read picture books and you can see that there's 19% of the books that are being banned are picture books. So the vast majority are not about little children, they're for uh, mature children. You don't see um, YA books, particularly um, it's very easy to search online in Massachusetts. You can search the statewide catalog and you don't see things like gender queer being offered to children. They are in YA, young adult. So, isn't it just books about sex? No, fully 40% are books about people of color and another 21% are about racial issues. So you don't always hear people talk about that online, but they are banning those books just the same. Despite the book protesters wanna talk loudly about sex and gender in books, 
They're just as intent on banning books about minority groups, including people who are Black, Hispanic, Asian, or Native, or sometimes a minority religion, such as being Jewish or Muslim. Uh, women's rights are often a target. So what books are being banned? Civil rights of all kinds. And Tango Makes Three, that uh, little uh, children's picture book, has actually zero sex in it at all, but it's about two male penguins who raise a baby chick. It's based on a true story. It does happen in the wild. It does happen in captivity. And somebody made a book about it. Let's see, what else? Uh, they Called Us Enemy, the one on the left, that is by George Takei, who you might remember from the original Star Trek. Uh, his book is about the uh, Japanese American internment, also has zero sex. He's gone on to make a Broadway play out of it, which I believe is now playing in England. Mouse, um, maybe some of you heard about the, the banning of uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse. It was actually uh, banned by the McMinn County uh, uh, school system for the eighth grade. It was about to be assigned to them. One day before it was assigned, they uh, was supposed to be assigned, they banned it, uh, leaving all the teachers and curriculum specialists scrambling to put a replacement book in. They said it was because they, there were swears in the book and because of a naked image of a woman, um, you have to look really hard to see uh, that the person in a bathtub shown from behind is a naked woman. And it's actually Art Spiegelman's mother who committed suicide. This very powerful, powerful book about generational trauma because of the Holocaust. Let's see, also there's, um, uh, uh, by the way, that was a Pulitzer Prize winning book, the first graphic novel to be so uh, awarded, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. That uh, one is often assigned in AP courses and now it's being banned, so it can't be taught there uh, in, the, in those school systems that remove it. It's Perfectly Normal has been in multiple, multiple editions and it has little cartoon illustrations of naked people in it and people are appalled. Now, some of these books may not be the kind of thing that uh, uh, you are interested in. It might not be something that I am interested in, but there are people out there that wanna read this, that it, it fills a, a niche in their life. And so then we offer them. Um, as a library director, I don't like every single book that's on the shelf, but I analyze my community and I pick those things that I think will help them. So uh, we know that uh, the count in 2021 of banned books is more than any of the prior 20 years and 2022 even superseded that. Is that count accurate? No, it's not. It's actually many, many more. Thing is, uh, people have to report them or uh, some of these counting organizations, uh, the ALA waits until there's a report. Some of the others like PEN America are taking a look at uh, uh, news reports and counting from there. Uh, most bans and challenges are never reported. And in some ways, that's a good thing in that um, somebody is coming to the librarian directly and they are working out something that might be mu mutually beneficial. That's fine. But unfortunately, it often means that somebody's embarrassed to report it, um, doesn't want it to be made public. And so it's hidden. And the intimidation that they're feeling may also engender uh, self-censorship where librarians are afraid to include certain books in the collection for fear that they may be targeted. So is all this book banning stuff new? No, it's not new. It's just simply more of it. 
uh, and it's more organized. Part of what is new about it is that they are circumventing normal policies and procedures, the going right to the uh, uh, librarian and having a conversation, a productive conversation about the book and their concerns. Those things are being wiped out. Instead, people are often mobbing board meetings, bringing PowerPoints that they've been trained to make. There are harassments and threats, and this is very new. Uh, these last few years. Um, in Millbury, this little uh, picture on the right here, four books were stolen in October 2021, and then they were returned the following March. The person who took them finally gave in. But um, in the meantime, people were marching around uh, uh, with posters like these following the head of the Friends of the Library and the board chair. In Waltham, two books were challenged, both were returned, but one was uh, ordered to have a warning sticker. Can you imagine a teenage book with a warning sticker that says, this is, this is mature material? Somehow I don't think that prohibits somebody from wanting to read it, certainly not a teenager. Um, there also were bomb threats during Banned Books Week. A Boston Public Library had them, Salt Lake City, Nashville, Fort Worth, Denver among them. So it got serious. In Montana, there was uh, award-winning libraries called Imagine If. And after some contentious board meetings over books, someone shot up some books and ac accidentally donated them to the book drop. So the police knew who they were, but uh, no action was taken, uh, except that a few uh, staff members immediately resigned. Um, in Idaho, a director resigned over the uh, vitriol and people were brandishing guns in her presence, uh, sitting in cars near her home, um, directed at her over books that weren't even in that library. So they were complaining about the books and the books weren't even on the shelf. So are these books really banned? Uh, is, is banned the right term for them? Yes, the word banned has been used at least since 1982, which was the first year of Banned Books Week. A book doesn't have to be nationally banned to be banned, it can be banned from a curriculum, can be banned from a school library or public library. It's still a ban. So can't those kids just go get the books elsewhere? Let's take them out of the library so nobody sees those nasty books and they can go somewhere else. They can go on Amazon. Well, not everybody, particularly not children, can access these places. They can't drive themselves. Um, maybe their family doesn't have time to go to a public library. Um, and, and more importantly, uh, it's a little bit about how children find books. They're not reading the New York Times book review. They are hearing from their peers, they're being assigned books, and they browse in the library. They just wander around until they bump into something. If those books aren't there, as far as those children are concerned, they don't exist. Uh, as Andrea was saying earlier, uh, aren't those books porn? Well, um, no one sex scene in a teen novel does not necessarily pornography make. Uh, obscenity is a legal term. And actually, uh, to determine if a book is uh, legally obscene has to be done in front of a judge, not a, a group of parents or other uh, group. Um, so pornography, in its essence, is intended to excite sexually, um, having read uh, gender queer from cover to cover. I don't see that it's pornography. And even the uh, two pages out of a 240 page book that are raw, I'm, I'm not going to sugar, sugarcoat that. They're, they're blunt. Um, but it's not pornographic. And even more unusually, a lot of people who complain about those uh, pages don't even know what it is because they haven't read it in context. And so they misinterpret what they're looking at. 
And then there's this interesting argument, but librarians remove books all the time. So why can't we do that too? Yes, as part of a collection development, uh, librarians do what's called weeding. We remove books that when they're worn out, we replace them because obviously people really want them. Uh, if people don't want them, then it's time to remove them to make room for more. If they've become out of date, Pluto's not anymore a planet, um, then they are moved, removed to make room for something that's more accurate and more up to date. That happens all the time. That's not the same as banning, which is a book that did meet the criteria for being included in the collection and then was forced out because somebody didn't like the content. Um, the way I think about it is, here's a litmus test. If the librarian changes her mind and decides to put the book back on the shelf, but then gets fired for it, that book was banned. Is this even legal? Removing books because you don't like the content violates the First Amendment freedom of speech clause which includes the right to receive speech through reading. And when it comes to schools, it was decided in 1982 in Island Trees v. Pico that students also have this right and it supersedes uh, concerns over content. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I can be honest here. Is it possible that a librarian uh, comes along who has ill intent and actually does put inappropriate books out there? Is there any recourse against so-called bad books? Well, of course there are. Uh, parents and community members have always had a say is in what is on the shelf. Okay, like we've been saying, you can go to the librarian first, have a conversation, um, have your concerns addressed. Then there are policies and procedures for reviewing that book if, if you still uh, feel like you disagree. Um, usually that entails filling out a form, um, meeting with a committee or the board of trustees, the library. Everybody reads the book and considers whether that needs to still be in the collection or not. Um, but remember, Start with your librarian. Like we've been saying, most people do trust their local librarian and do trust what's on the shelf. Have that conversation. Um, many of those disagreements end right there. So what can we do? Um, I know, uh, Andrea, you wanted to say something about using the toolkit at ALA's Unite Against Book Bans. They have created uh, a special um, website for this. Yeah, so uh, there are a couple of great, uh, just since 2021, since we've seen this huge uptick in censorship, uh, a couple of great campaign building tools um, to help us, to help those of us that are against censorship, which is again, the vast majority of Americans are against censorship, to help us get our messaging out there, to help us um, rally behind our communities, our schools, our educators, our librarians. Um, and the first is the American Library Association's Unite Against Book Bans. There are wonderful um, infographics and talking points. I'm gonna share some of those at the very end. Um, there, there's also like letter writing campaigns and that kind of thing. And then the next one is every library's um, fight for the first campaign. And this helps helps local communities to start a petition saying that they want uh, the books kept in their kids' school or um, to have a rally to counter protest against the, the neo-Nazis or others who might be showing up at public libraries to protest programs. Um, these are really important tools for the public. We hope that you will utilize them we really need to get out in front of this and not let a small, noisy minority um, decide what our kids and what we can have access to. And then I think Sharon, you're gonna take on the rest. Yeah, thank you very much. So, you know, if your child is reading a controversial book, instead of shocking them and grabbing it away, 
um, try reading it with them. Discuss it with your child. Very often uh, books that uh, uh, deal with um, crucial subjects, things like sex education, uh, open the door for uh, uh, parents to have uncomfortable conversations. Uh, I know for myself, um, uh, baby boomer that I am, uh, we weren't told a lot about sex ed from our parents at home. And so, you know, deep breath. Uh, sorry, kids, my parents never told me about this, but I want you to know. And sometimes a book is just the right thing to help make that happen. Uh, read banned books. Find out what's really in those that we're so concerned about. Um, we, uh, when this came up about a year ago, I uh, took some time at my library to get out a list of 850 books that um, a legislator in Texas had concern about. And so I took out his entire list. We looked through our collection and found that we had uh, approximately, I believe it's 41 of the books that were on that list. Um, that is approximately 0.2% of our entire collection. If you want to think of it this way, um, given that the number of people of color and people on the LGBTQ community um, are probably more than 2%, maybe we don't have enough books. Um, so form a band book club. Uh, teens across the United States are doing that. Um, I know the uh, gentleman from Millbury um, who was being targeted with um, posters actually um, collected a number of, of banned books and was distributing them all over the country for free. Give to organizations that assist libraries. Um, we're especially grateful to PEN America every library, the ACLU, and the American Library Association. Um, discuss online what you know, stick to the facts. Um, I want to, I like to avoid name calling and, and act as a librarian in those kinds of conversations. Um, give people knowledge and then they will be less apt to be afraid of what's going on. And please support the freedom to read. So thank you for being here today, for wanting to know the facts and for supporting libraries, teachers and librarians and our freedom to read. And Sharon and, and others, I just wanted to put up one more um, slide to share. Um, these are talking points if, if you're, um, your uncle or your neighbor um, is pro-censorship, let's say. Um, these are some talking points that'll help you talk with the people in your life um, and might make them think a little bit about why, even if we find something offensive, we don't have to remove it for others or make that choice for others. So these are some really great talking points to to um to share with anyone and anyone who will listen. Thank you, Andrea and Sharon. That was wonderful. And we have a few questions coming into the Q&A right now. So I will read those for you. Okay, first one. Do some of these groups, such as Mothers for Liberty, ever complain about historically anti-Semitic books like Grimm's Fairy Tales? One story is the Jew in the bush. Years ago, our daughter, whose dad is Jewish, asked me if we should rip it out of the book, but we decided to keep it as a reminder that some people have bad thoughts and write them down. So this is also coming up with um, Roald Dahl this week, mm -hmm. uh, changing the language of his books. So Sharon, you look like you had something to say for that one. Yeah. I. I I did want to say um, uh, this is not just a Republican Democrat issue. Um, extremists ban books, and they ban them for different reasons. Um, but overwhelmingly, what's happening right now 
is um, books are being challenged and banned um, because of LGBTQ rights or um, minority civil rights. And although I haven't heard the Grimm's fairy tale one, um, certainly uh, Mouse has to do with the Holocaust. Um, whether it was uh, facetious or not, Anne Frank's diary has been banned. And I'm not sure if that was in retaliation for other bans like, oh, you ban that? Well, I can ban this. Um, or if it actually was an anti-Semitic uh, type of act. I, I haven't heard anything about Moms for Liberty having a problem with anti-Semitism. Um, I, there, there was re, just last year a challenge that came to five noble libraries, which is what Salem Public Library is part of that library consortium, uh, accusing a children's picture book of being anti-Semitic. Um, I would see, we see usually see more bands coming in um, of uh, the Jewish voices, Jewish stories are more likely to be censored um, than those that are anti-Semitic. But we have seen it. Um, and I think that the questioner's response of, of leaving something in the book rather than sort of censoring it is a really good response because there are so many imperfect and offensive things that we encounter. And I, I do think that it, it is a very mature point to be able to kind of like view it and talk about it with your children and not pretend it's not out there. Um, so that was a good question and I think a, a, a good parenting choice. Right, definitely an opportunity for learning. Um, next question, has either of these speakers felt personally threatened by the book banning trend? Uh, yeah, I can talk about that as somebody that's uh, talking online. Currently, there is nothing going on in my library, and I have a very supportive board, which is why I'm able to do things like this. Um, but yes, because I'm um, discussing this online, um, I've been called groomer. Uh, I've uh, been called other not so nice names that can't be repeated here. Um, I know that uh, some of the people I've discussed this with have jumped over to my Facebook page trying to get further information. It doesn't take much to look me up online. So somebody um, uh, tried to come back in and uh, dox the uh, town that I work in. Um, so yeah, that but have I felt viscerally um, threatened? Um, no, I'm going to uh, continue to talk in as safe and as clear a manner as I can, because I think this is a very important issue. How about you, Andrea? I, I will say I did feel viscerally threatened um, that day, that just last month we had that, that um, pride story time and we had five police, um, including one in our office, um, watching and definitely there were people that, that didn't feel safe. That said, this is, we are not used to being called pornographers or pedophiles and those are terrible things to call other people. Um, in the case of pedophilia, that's a that's a law breaking offense that should go straight to um, law enforcement rather than hurling it on social media. But I really want to say we know who we are. We are a strong profession. We have strong values. We are here to serve everyone in the community. And I want to assert that we have some confidence in what we're doing, and that. Even if we're being bullied, we're going to stand up for other people's rights. We're going to stand up for this democratic institution. We're going to stand up for the right of children to be educated um, and for all of us to have lifelong learning and for the rights of all of us to be offended by the rest of us. <laughs> like that's just <laughs> part of the human experience. Um, so I want to lead from a position of strength. Um, we are not cowering. This is a small minority of people. They've they've really weaponized um, these tactics and they've gotten really nasty. But 
there are more of us and we have the better message. And um, I don't ever want to lose sight of that. And if I could just jump in with something that's uh, more serious. Um, Andrea spoke a little bit about uh, having uh, militia type groups trying to invade um, drag queen story times. And um, that's really uh, some serious intimidating stuff. In some states you have open carry and they are going armed and trying to enter buildings. Um, so it's, it's really strong intimidation. And I'm, um, I'm perplexed that uh, groups that are saying that they are trying to do this to protect children are going in and frightening children uh, by walking into these rooms. It needs to stop. Um, next question, in Andrea's slide with 16%, how is the book deemed inappropriate? Yeah. Uh, my slide with the 16%. <laughs> Do we need Hold to on. Um, uh, so I, I think it was a really general question. If I'm remembering right, this is from the Deseret News. I know you think I'm saying that wrong, but uh, uh, my husband's from Utah and I know that's how you say it. Yeah. You say it like the French. Um, I think that was a very general question of um, even if a book is uh, like how many how many people think that books are inappropriate that are in school libraries? I, I believe that was the stat. Um, and the answer was only 16% of those surveyed thought that school public school libraries had inappropriate materials on their shelves. Um, and another note about the like what is inappropriate for a certain age group, librarians actually don't determine where something belongs in the collection in terms of audience level. Um, in, in terms of like age or literacy level, that is something that publishers and distributors um, offer to us. And we, we almost always trust their professional judgment on where something belongs. Is it a picture book that is for ages four to six? Is it a, um, you know, a chapter book that's for ages such to such? Is it a book for teens? Um, those are things that we actually don't determine. Just like we don't determine if it's a G-rated movie or an R-rated movie, that's not us. So we're putting it where distributors tell us to put it. And distributors and, and marketers, publishers, they have a strong interest in never, never giving us something inappropriate because that comes back and bites them um, in their wallet. So for instance, obscenity, obscenity is illegal. It would never make it to a library shelf, it just wouldn't. You, you would be in deep trouble to distribute it or to publish it, it wouldn't happen. Pornography, some of it's legal and technically we could collect it if we wanted to. I think very few public libraries collect pornography. I mean, there have been cases where um, libraries collected like Playboy or something and, and um, had that available for the public, but uh, we do not collect it period. Yep. Has the, how, well, excuse me, <laughs> get my H words right. How has the efforts of certain groups or the book banning trend hurt funding for libraries? And what can people do to support their local library funding goals? That's a really good question and something we didn't really touch on, though I think Sharon and I probably meant to. So there, there have been a lot of legislative attempts to put new rules in place that harm libraries in various ways. Um, gag orders, um, trying to have tribunals that uh, determine whether something is appropriate, defunding libraries, um, getting staff fired. I mean, all of these things have been tried in multiple fronts in multiple places. In terms of funding, show up for those trustee meetings, um, show up for your, your town meetings, uh, know who you're voting for when you vote for your school committee and your bo library board of trustees, please inform yourself on these small local elections, they matter. Um, make sure that you're not getting censors elected because that is one of the tactics that we didn't get into tonight, but that is, that is obviously the best tactic is to get the censors elected to the school boards and the, the board of trustees. And that is happening. 
Um, why? Because the appetite and energy are there on the on the other side, whereas those of us who are anti-censorship aren't paying as close of attention. So really that legislative piece that um, making sure you're you're voting and you know you're informed on what people's points of view and school boards and, and board of trustees is really important. And that it, that in the end, I think is going to be the best for funding. Sharon, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, yes, um, definitely in various states around uh, the country, um, I heard the number 44 states now have actually proposed uh, legislation that would restrict books in libraries. That was a Panamerica quote very recently. Um, now, many of those are not going anywhere, but far too many of them are uh, being forwarded and are becoming state law. Um, are they constitutional? Maybe not, but somebody has to challenge those laws and take them through the courts to make them go away. So in this area, very definitely uh, speak to your local librarian and offer that if uh, that you are an advocate and that you would like to help if there's a problem, that way uh, the director knows who to reach out for. Um, if there is a problem, they know where the advocates are and who to talk to. Um, definitely talk to your uh, state legislators um, and let them know where you stand on this issue. Every year, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners uh, submits uh, funding requests, and that includes uh, state funds uh, that go directly to libraries across the state. Um, and various types of grant uh, uh, projects and applications. So um, make sure that they know that this is an important part of what the state funds. Great, and there's an allied question here. So maybe I'll read it before you answer, Andrea. Is that okay? Um, are Massachusetts politicians, in particular the governor's office, doing anything to support teachers and libraries during this time and to maintain Massachusetts's high stand standards of education and literacy in an age of growing censorship and anti-intellectualism? So is there um, anything happening on the state level? Well, my, my committee has been talking to state legislators, anyone who will listen to us. Um, we are we do have a library legislative day coming up on March 15th at the state house. We, we also host them throughout the state and we are talking to them about these issues. Um, I would say that one of the things we are really trying to get across to the, 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 the legislature right now is that the school libraries need to all have libraries and, and professional librarians. That is not actually the case or the rule. They also do not have one unified point overseeing all the school libraries. So the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and uh, the Massachusetts School Library Association, who I work with, they are asking, please, please make sure our um, children's schools have libraries and have professional librarians and um, because it's especially in the schools where it's just one librarian if you're lucky they are going to be the people who are standing up for intellectual freedom issues because I think if you don't really come into this with a viewpoint of like we don't censor we don't censor we don't censor we don't censor because it leads it where do you end and who's who's making those judgments about what's not appropriate um once that goes to the school board or once that goes out to a principal or it goes to the the town hall it, those intellectual freedom principles sometimes get kind of blurry and they think well why can't we compromise on why can't why can't we get rid of these five books like so so why don't we just keep the sex ed books behind the desk or why don't we just take out the offending page of the grim fairy tale, you know, like, let's just take it out or put a little disclaimer on it. These are all forms of censorship. And um, we don't want other people making those choices for us. So we don't want to make those choices for others. I can't underline that enough about having uh, trained school library media specialists in every school. Um, they are the ones that are uh, teaching um, against fake news and, and helping children to understand how to analyze what they're finding online, 
and how to go and find uh, good resources instead of just any resource. The internet has a lot of information. It doesn't always have um, an easy access to just good information. And that's what librarians do is they point students to where the good stuff is. Right. Next question. What have your board's roles been when a book is challenged? Yeah, you know, mine's, uh, I'll just say really quickly, mine is a very, very small um, public library, obviously. Uh, and uh, so if there were a book challenge that rose to the level of a formal challenge, then it would be up to my board itself to do the review of the book. That's the way our policy is written. Mm -hmm. my, my, my public library's board is very supportive. Um, that's not always the case I, because like I said, not, not boards don't always see the problem and just sort of appeasing the angry people. <laughs> like, why not just give in to them? Wouldn't that make it easier? No. <laughs> um, right, so. So yeah, yeah floodgates then, right? Floodgates every- Yeah, I mean, we've seen a come. lot of people try to appease the angry, um, the angry voices, uh, including sometimes librarians. But I think once you step away from the actual library workers, you get even more, more um, of an effort to kind of be like, okay, well, it's not a big deal. We'll just, we'll just take these off the shelf or we just, we just won't have a pride story time because we don't want that controversy. You know, we're- We'll we put a warning it. sticker on it so that all the teenagers know that it's a yeah. controversial book. <laughs> yeah. By the way, if once you once you censor something, it usually it usually goes way up in sales. So it's yeah. not a best tactic. Yeah. Mouse that's been uh, you know uh, uh, hovering in the background for years suddenly broke Amazon practically with people rushing to get it. Um, but yes, um, directors, we need to be educating our boards on this issue. So when it does come up, they're ready. It is part of their job, both in policy and in advocating for the library. Um, those are two of the four prongs of what they're supposed to be doing. And uh, they are experts in their communities and much to be lauded for that, but they're not always experts in library science. So that's where we come in. So what about the opposite case where somebody insists that copies of their books be shelved or copies of their choice books be shelved, even if the library's policies suggest it may be inappropriate. We've had that happen. Um, I do a lot of collection development in my, my library and we, we had someone who um, insisted on donating some books that were, had some factual <laughs> problems um, that, that had a very strong um, social political viewpoint. And we have a policy against donations. We don't take donations. And that's one of the reasons we don't is that we, we have standards and we have a budget and we want to follow our standards and we want to spend our budget. Um, some libraries do take donations, but that is like a weaselly little way to get books that maybe don't belong in the collection in the collection. Um, and yes, we've also had requests for things that we were like, oh, is this misinformation? You know, that 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 is always a tricky thing. It's like Sometimes there are books and media that are right on the line between being just blatant misinformation and being just kind of opinions that are maybe not great opinions about infectious disease and such, you know, um, it, it, it's going to be a little tricky. So yes, people do try to get things added to the collection that don't always belong. And sometimes those are nuanced decisions. Right. I, I appreciate people that want to donate to a book to the library, like here, now you have more books and you don't have to spend as much money. But we think very uh, deliberately about what goes on to the shelf. And so our collection development policy does say that that determination is made by the professional staff. Um, within that, though, um, this library has a local author collection because we found that some people were very interested in finding out what uh, some of their neighbors were writing. And so if it is somebody that's local, we may happily uh, incorporate that into our local author section, for example, um, if it doesn't fall into the criteria that would put it in the main collection. So there are ways to get there from here. But um, I think one of my favorite ways 
Uh, I've had this happen twice now where somebody wanted to make a memorial uh, donation in one case and in another, it was a nonprofit organization that wanted to enhance our collection. So I sat down with those individuals. We had a chat about exactly what um, materials we would purchase that would be advantageous to the collection and really meet the criteria of what we were trying to collect. Um, great conversation, wonderful donation, and the books are being used. Perfect. Does the current banning environment extend to adult literature? Yes, um, though I think one of the tactics used is often that you're trying to protect the youth, right? I and mean, that, that is most adults who want to ban things say, but we're doing it for the children. <laughs> but yes, there. If you if we go back to those slides that Sharon and I showed of what's being banned, a lot of those are adult titles, um, like The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, a literary giant. Um, that's been on that list for decades. Um, the 1619 Project is a, is a book for adults. Um, I think How to Be Anti-Racist is on there, a book for adults. Um, yes, there, there are plenty of adult titles that get that get challenged every year. And it, yeah, I mean, we, we're seeing an uptick on all kinds of bands, but certainly going after schools and going after teen content is the most popular form of censorship out there right now. And I wanted to also say, you all are a great audience. You were asking such good questions. You're clearly really dedicated library users and I love it. So thank you. Yeah, we have just a few more if everybody's willing to hang in there. Um, after 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security wanted libraries to report on people who read dangerous materials and librarians successfully fought against that. Did you have any, how that relates to our talk tonight? Um, that's a, that's the last time librarians were really in the news was during the Patriot Act. So what happened um, during the Patriot Act is sort of a lot of civil liberties and um, like intellectual freedom kind of got rescinded in order to fight terrorism. And um, what was happening, I think it was the FBI, Sharon, you can correct me if I'm wrong, who ha had gone into libraries demanding to see the, the internet records. The, the newly formed Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security. I believe. Yeah. And they didn't have a warrant. And so you can, if you're in a criminal investigation, you can walk into a library and demand to see something. I mean, we, we try to keep patron records private, but if you have a warrant and we have information, a judge has determined that that is uh, in the best interests of the public to to um, look at that information, whatever we have. In this case, they didn't have a warrant, so they just were coming in on a fishing expedition to try to look at all of the search history of of a patron. And it was, I think, it happened in more than one case, but one memorable case was in Connecticut, and the librarian said, "No, you need a warrant. Learn the law and come back." <laughs> so. So and worse, they had gagged the um, librarians were not even allowed to consult an attorney on, on the legitimacy of the request. So part of the pushback is, is now we're back to where, yes, you need to uh, present a warrant. Um, I did have one situation where the police were looking at someone um, and uh, uh, the person had been in the library and they asked if they could see um, the computer and look at the computer history. And I said, do you have a warrant? And he said, no, but I could ask. And I smiled and said, yes, you can. <laughs> you can ask, but you can't search without a warrant. We, we do um, balance and take very seriously um, the right of people to privately access the information that they want to learn. So we have two questions related to the Roald Dahl situation. Um, but first, I'm going to do the other remaining one, which is, are you open to offering this session to other groups? If yes, how do we contact you? So they want more, folks. They want more. <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
I'm at Nahant Public Library. We, you can find the contact on the website and the email will get to me. Yeah, and uh, you're, you're welcome to reach out to Jean Marie and Carolyn and the Salem Athenaeum to get to get contact for me. Um, yeah, I've been very busy talking about this stuff. Yes, we'll be happy to provide that. Yeah, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah, I really want to see that um, more people are stepping up. As we've been saying over and over, the majority of people support their local libraries and their librarians. Um, this is a noisy, noisy minority that is out there. And so if half of the people who were supportive of librarians stood up, this would go away in a heartbeat. Okay, so finally, um, can you explain what's happening with the role of doll books replacing offensive words? And if they do issue them, which they probably will because money is on the line, um, would your library keep the new editions as well as the old editions in the collection? This is something very similar the, uh, to what happened just a couple of years ago with the Dr. Seuss books. The idea that the heirs of their copyright uh, wanted to make sure that the brand um, was family friendly and that there, they felt there were certain aspects that were dated um, and so wanted to remove them. In the case of Dr. Seuss, five or maybe six uh, fairly obscure titles, except that it included, and to think that I uh, saw it on Mulberry Street, which was his first children's book, uh, were removed from publication. I frankly hope that uh, with just a little bit of adjustment of the illustrations, they would be re-released. Um, and uh, knowing that Dr. Seuss's um, feelings toward minority groups had changed over the years, I think he would agree. Perhaps we're seeing the same thing with the Rao doll books that they are uh, trying to change some of the wording in the books. Um, librarians have different opinions on this one. Um, I, my opinion, frankly, is that it'll, it's a little bit heavy handed um, in, in what they're changing. Uh, I frankly would like us to someday, my very optimistic self hopes that someday that we all just think of these as words. They're just words on a page. They don't destroy our lives. Um, uh, words like fat are being removed um, while there are many uh, overweight women who have no problem with using the word fat. Those are the kinds of things that are happening with the Raul Dahl book. Uh, I, I feel like Jean Marie, you might know more about this than I do, but um, yeah, I'm against it. <laughs> I, I think a lot of younger librarians um, think that it's up to us as educators to, to not have um, sort of objectionable content, content that is bigoted um, or insensitive. I, I would counter that the best um, argument against a bad idea is a good idea and that you don't have to go scrubbing all the bad ideas out because actually we all have bad ideas. <laughs> like we literally all have bad ideas, even when we think we have a good idea. Ask your grandchildren in 30 years if some of your ideas when you were young were actually kind of insensitive and not so great. Yeah, I I'll agree. One of, the, one of the best ways to make um, a, a bad book book go away is don't check it out. Yeah, um, yeah. librarians are a natural death. Right, we're, mm -hmm. we're constantly wanted... looking at our circulation statistics to see what people are interested in. If they're not interested in the book, the book goes away. Yeah, and um, I would I would also add that with Roald Dahl, um, there's so much good too. So, do we throw it all out, or do we go in and s censor little bits of it? I'd just say no to that. No, right. and and we can counter it, like especially as educators, can counter it with a more inclusive title that's new and has a different perspective. Right, and that's the beauty is that the publishing world is finally catching up. They're letting more and more voices out. Um, they're they're promoting more and more voices. And we have a more diversified um, content than we've ever had in libraries. So I, you kind of have to trust to some extent that people are going to make some good choices and that, that the quality stuff is going to come to the top and we don't have to, we don't have to try to purify everything. 
One of the things that we haven't discussed, and, and I just want to touch on it briefly, is we are not giving children enough credit to un, that they are understanding what they're reading and what's going on. Um, I read um, The Ugly Duckling to a bunch of uh, kindergartners, and we went through how that, you know, the, the duckling suddenly turned into a beautiful swan and then everybody loved him. And I, and I just asked the class afterwards, I was, you know, without any nuance on it. Um, well, what do you think about that? Do you think that uh, uh, they should love the swan just because, uh, I didn't even say just, because he's beautiful? And they thought for a beat and then they said, no. I said, well, why not? And they said, the kindergartner said, the five-year-old said, because it's what's on the inside that's the most important. Kids understand when they read things if the language is stilted or if it's not um, the kinds of things that mom and dad are teaching them at home. They get it. Teenagers want to know. They don't want pablum given to them. They want to know the real facts about what's going on in their lives. Half of teenagers today are having sex. They need to know. Um, we need to provide books that will help them with these problems. On that note, we're finished with our questions. Any final thoughts from Andrea and Sharon? I think we've talked a lot, haven't we? Yeah. Well, you've been a wonderful audience, fabulous questions. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Andrea and Sharon. And let's keep fighting the good fight against censorship. Good night, everyone. <laughs>